There are six articles of faith. They are very essential things which every Muslim believes in. And I'm going to be expounding those six articles of faith. So the first of them is belief in Allah. The second is belief in the angels. The third is belief in the messengers. And the fourth is believing in the books. The fifth is believing in the day of judgment, the final day, and all the events that take place afterwards, paradise, hellfire, and so on and so forth, the life after death. And the final one is the divine decree. Let's talk about the first one, believing in Allah. Obviously, is that one has to believe that God, the creator, Allah, exists. Allah is not a different God. He is not a new God that was invented by the Prophet Muhammad. The pagan Arabs, before the time of the Prophet Muhammad, had a concept of the supreme divine being as the Quran actually says if you ask them who is the Lord of the seven heavens who is the Lord of the glorious throne they will surely say Allah they will surely say God so they recognized that there was this supreme being they never had an idol they never had an image of Allah they never had an image of God the concept was there of this being who created the heavens and the earth who had power and control of all things, who sent down the rain, who caused the crops to grow, and who was not like anything in this creation. This is the universal belief we find amongst human beings. In fact, you find every culture in every age and every time has within it some concept of a supreme deity who is distinct and separate from the rest of the creation. The idea that there is no God or the actual belief that God does not exist has been there in human history but it's always been uh, a small minority. Very few people have been able to accept uh, such a rather absurd concept because human reason, common sense, our very nature lends us almost inevitably by looking and contemplating and observing the world around us, the universe around us, looking at ourselves, there are so many signs and indications that there is intelligence, wisdom, power, will behind the creation of the universe. So these signs are a kind of evidence that the Creator exists. But there is no need for us to ask the question, as some people do, well, who created the Creator? Because as the Qur'an tells us, say He is Allah, the One. Allah is the One upon which and upon whom everything depends, whereas God Himself is self-sufficient and needs nothing. He is not born, nor does He give birth, and there is nothing that can be likened unto Him. In reality, whatever you can imagine in your mind, God is not like that. Because the only thing you can imagine in your mind is something based upon your experience as a human being of the world and the universe around you. God is not like anything we can imagine. The greatest sin and the greatest crime that a human being can commit as far as God is concerned, in the eyes of God, in the sight of God, is that we should ascribe partners to Him. That we should make something in this limited finite universe equal to God. So for example, if we were to say and we were to imagine that some human being could respond to our supplications and our prayers, then 
we would be ascribing to that human being a type of power and ability that only belongs to God. You see some people, they call upon saints, they call upon prophets, they supplicate to them, they call them, they make prayers to them. But if you think about it, if we have a thousand human beings all praying to Jesus or Muhammad or Saint, how would this human being be able to hear all of these discordant voices all at the same time and be able to make sense of them? That is not a capability that a human being has. If you're saying that they have this ability, you are now beginning to claim that they have the powers and they have the knowledge and they have the ability that only belongs to God. And this is the greatest lie. The greatest lie against God and the greatest distortion in respect to the reality of the limitations of his creation. There is a saying that the Prophet Muhammad mentioned that on the day of judgment a man will stand in front of God. He will stand in front of Allah and Allah will say to him, if you had the world and everything in it, would you ransom it now to save yourself from the hellfire? And this man will say, yes, my Lord. And Allah will say to him, I asked of you less than that. I only asked you that you should worship me and not associate anything as an equal with me. He, he will forgive any sin, but he will not forgive. If a person dies, not repenting from making partners with him, he will not forgive that person and they will dwell in the hellfire forever. So it's very serious. Another pillar of the Muslim belief, and that is the belief in angels. Within Judaism, within Christianity, the story of the fall of Adam and Eve is generally considered to be that Satan or the devil uh, was actually an angel. And so there is the concept that angels, like human beings, have a choice or an ability to believe or disbelieve in God. And uh, we do not accept that. Uh, what God has taught us in the Quran and through his final messenger Muhammad is that the angels are beings, they are made of light and they do not have the ability to disobey Allah. Angels are beings that fulfill the command of God. They do have some form of intellect. They are able to question, they have an ability to think, and we can see that from the story mentioned in the Qur'an of the fall of Adam and Eve. When God or Allah is creating Adam, he's telling the angels, I am going to create a creature that will be succeeding one after the other, generation after the generation on the earth. So the angels asked and they questioned, are you going to create something that will shed blood and make mischief while we uh, celebrate your praises and we glorify your name? And God said to them, I know what you don't know. There are many, many, many angels and they perform many tasks. The most important or the head of the angels is Gabriel. Gabriel is traditionally what we call an archangel. Gabriel is the chief of the angels, he is the greatest of the angels uh, and Gabriel is responsible, or Jibril, we call him in Arabic Jibril is also the Holy Spirit The Holy Spirit is not some part of God The Holy Spirit is a creature of God, a creation of God and the angels they, as we need air and food, they need to remember God and praise God. The angels are sustained through their remembrance and their obedience to God. Gabriel performs many functions, but the most important function of the angel Gabriel is that he is the one who brings the revelation. He is the one who has brought down uh, the, the Torah, and the Zabur and the Injil and of course the Qur'an which is the final revelation 
to Prophet Muhammad. There are other angels that perform important functions which are worth mentioning. Every single one of us has two angels that write down the deeds. The angel on the right writes down our good deeds and the angel on the left writes down our evil deeds. This belief in the angels is something that should help to create within the believer a constant awareness that whatever they do and whatever they say is being accounted for and being written and being recorded by the angels and this books of deeds, these books of deeds will be presented on the day of judgment. We also have a guardian angel in the sense that what is called a guardian angel but uh, it is an angel that helps to protect us, that also advises us and encourages us towards good. Also to mention, by the way, that everybody also has an evil jinn. And this evil jinn prompts us towards evil. Other angels that are worth mentioning is the angel of death, whose responsibility is to take the souls of people when they die. There is also an angel, and this angel right now as the Prophet Muhammad said, this is the angel who will blow the trumpet and this trumpet will bring about the end of this world. And as the Prophet Muhammad said, the angel has raised the trumpet to his lips and he is waiting for the command from God to blow that trumpet. There are others, many, many others, for example, the angels who guard the gates of hell, the angels who will greet the people uh, when they uh, enter paradise. There are angels of mountains, angels of rivers, angels of clouds, angels of thunder, angels of lightning. There are angels, all of these angels, what do they do? They help to direct the creation of Allah according to the plan of Allah. The Prophet Muhammad said that Allah or God has sent over 124,000 messengers. We believe as Muslims that God has sent messengers to every people in every age. It is not that just God has only sent messengers to the Bani Israel or the children of Israel. Every people have had messengers sent to them to remind them that they should single out God for worship and they should avoid the worship of all false gods. The messengers are all human beings. Yes, they are extraordinary human beings in the sense that, in terms of their character, they are very truthful, trustworthy, honest. Uh, this is the characteristic of the messengers. So why is it so important that God has chosen human beings to be messengers for human beings? The reason is because the messengers are living examples of how to follow that message. So not only do they deliver a message, but they do it in the most effective and practical way that leaves the recipient with the least excuse not to follow God's guidance. The example of the Prophet Muhammad, which is called in Islamic tradition, the Sunnah, which means the way. So his example is considered to be as important as the Quran, as a source of information on how to follow God's religion and how to obey God. This is why you will find people talking often about the Quran and the Sunnah. Because the Sunnah is the practical implementation of the Quran. We can't explain the Quran correctly without the existence of the Sunnah. The Quran directs us and guides us to many things, to good manners, to neighborliness to obedience to your parents but the prophet muhammad 
May God's peace and blessings be upon him details for us how those things practically should manifest themselves in our lives. And because he was a human being and he not only taught those things but he showed us how to do them. From a psychological point of view that means that if one human being can do it then another human being can do it. It's very interesting that one of the things that the pagan Arabs complained about was if God is going to send a messenger why doesn't he send an angel to announce all of this to us? And the explanation for that is really quite simple because an angel, the nature of an angel, don't have a choice to obey or disobey God. Angels naturally obey God. If God had sent angels, then we human beings would be saying, oh, well, it's easy for you to say, don't do this or do that. You're an angel. But if you were a human like us, you would understand how difficult it is. If the messenger is human, and he is practically showing us, even though he also has the same desires as us, yet this human, this man, this person, still manages to accomplish living his life in a way that is most pleasing to Allah. That until today stands as a most excellent example for anybody who believes in God in the last day, actually only makes him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam more extraordinary and more a object of our love and adoration and desire to emulate. Now all believers love the prophets of God. Actually different prophets had different qualities. And the Qur'an mentions many prophets, including those who are very, very familiar to Jews and Christians. Moses is mentioned in the Qur'an. Part of the reason for God telling us the stories of the prophets is to be a source of inspiration and motivation for the believers. Jesus is mentioned in the Qur'an and it is made very clear that although he was created miraculously by God, he was still a human being. He was born and he will die. This is the reality of Jesus and all the prophets of God. We have Noah, we have Abraham is mentioned in the Quran, we have John the Baptist, we have Elijah, we have Jonah, we have uh, Solomon and David, there were over 124,000 messengers sent to humanity. That we did not send to any nation a messenger except that he called the people to worship God alone and to reject the worship of the false gods. This is the call and this is the message of all the messengers and that was the message of the final prophet, Muhammad. May God's peace and blessings be upon him. The next article of faith that we want to talk about is the fact that God has given to certain messengers books. A book doesn't necessarily have to be, for example, written down. It could be memorized. But the main point being is that the book is a message that is clear, that is consistent, and that follows a certain format. So the reason for God sending books is that having a book means that there is a permanent or at least semi-permanent point of reference. There is something that after the prophets have left us, after the prophets have died, the books remain. So that when people claim that we should do this or we should not do this, and that is what God requires of us, we go back to the book and we see, well, what does the book say? The Qur'an teaches us that there have been many messengers and there have also been many books. But the most important 
books are the suhufa or certain pages or certain things that were given to Abraham there is the Torah that was given to Moses there is the Zabur that was given to David and there is the Injil that was given to Jesus there is the Quran that was given to the last and final prophet the last and final messenger Muhammad may God's peace and blessings be upon him now there are two terms in Arabic uh, that refer to the people to whom God has given revelation and tasked them with the responsibility of preaching and passing on the message so one is Nabi is more general than the other word which is Rasul so Nabi you could say means a messenger or a prophet but the word Rasul is someone who has been given in a sense a type of extra responsibility they have had a book that has been given to them and often this book formulates new laws new codes that have either not existed before or they change certain codes of conduct so this is part of the characteristic of a Rasul Jews and Christians have with them scripture and that's why they're called people of the book so it is recognized that they have scripture but the Quran is telling us that people have unfortunately changed and corrupted and distorted the original messages that God gave to those prophets what we have to believe in as Muslims is that God gave a book to Moses called the Torah does that Torah still exist certainly not in its pure original pristine form so it's a belief in something that happened it's a belief that God chose messengers he gave those messengers books and that is something that consistently God has done throughout history the last book that God has revealed is the Quran there is no more written definitive point of reference after the Quran so the Quran has a unique status in history that is why God the Creator has promised to preserve the Quran this book is to be preserved whether something is lawful or prohibited whether something should be done this way or that way what does God want from us how does God want us to be it is part of the great blessings that God has given to humanity promised to preserve it from alteration and corruption amongst the most important things that every Muslim has to believe is in respect to the events after death when a person dies, we believe that the angel of death comes to take the soul. And the journey of the soul rather depends upon whether one is a believer and one was righteous or one was a person who rejected faith and was committing sins and transgressions. So the journey of the soul of the believer after death is a very pleasant one. The Prophet Muhammad said that this life for the believer is like a prison so it is like a paradise for the disbeliever and like a prison for the believer so when the angel of death comes to take the soul of the believer who has died this soul will leave the body very easily and the angels who are gathered there will wrap this soul in, in beautiful soft and sweet scented cloths and they will take it up through the heavens and as this soul goes through the heavens it will be called by all the good names and praised by the good things that it had done in the life of this world and then when it reaches the heavens it will be announced that it will go uh, back to its grave and it will return to its grave and then every soul will be questioned believer or non-believer everyone will be questioned the two angels Munkar and Nakir and they will ask the soul, the believing soul, three very important questions. Who was your Lord? What was your religion? And what did you think of this man who was sent amongst you? 
meaning the Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him. So obviously the believing soul will reply, my Lord was Allah, my religion was Islam, and this man was Muhammad. And they will say, may you have a goodly end. And then the grave of the believer will turn into as if it were a garden of paradise. It will be spacious and luminous and beautiful smells from paradise will come in. And the time of this person in the grave will seem like a short time because this person will be praying in the grave, making dua in the grave, asking Allah to please let the day of judgment come because they want to hasten to their place in paradise. The day of judgment for everybody is uh, a terrifying and calamitous time, but for the believer, there is relative ease. And every believer, again, will have to pass over the hellfire on a bridge that is thinner than a hair and sharper than a sword. People will pass over this bridge in proportion to the good deeds that they did. Some people, unfortunately, even will fall into the hellfire, even though they were believers due to their sins. Then there will be an intercession where the prophets and the pious and the righteous and the learned uh, will intercede for those believing people who had fallen into the hellfire for them to be taken out of the hellfire. So when all of this has happened, then the people will pass into paradise. And the paradise is a place, there is no suffering, there is no pain, there is no age, there is no hatred, there is no envy, there is no greed. Any evil or unpleasant thing that you can imagine will not exist in paradise. It is a place of complete peace, of complete tranquility, of complete happiness, of complete love. And this happiness in paradise will be of a spiritual nature, it will be of a mental nature, and it will be of a physical nature. Things there that no eye has ever seen and no mind can even imagine. They will stay there forever, they will dwell in this place forever. As for the journey of the evil soul, this soul does not want to leave the body, it clings to the body. Indeed, the angel of death will rip this soul out of the body. The gathered angels will look terrifying and they will wrap this soul in a harsh and evil smelling cloth. And it will be taken up through the heavens and it will be called by the bad names and reminded of the evil deeds that it had done in this life by the inhabitants of the heavens. And then it will be thrown down to its torment in the grave. And so when Munkar and Nakir come and question this soul, he or she will not know the answers. They will make a cry of pain, like, ah, I do not know. What was your religion? I don't know. Who is this man sent amongst you? And they will say, oh, I heard the people saying this, and I heard the people saying that, and I just said what everybody else said. So they will say, you lived in doubt and you died in doubt, and God willing, you'll be raised on doubt. And so this grave will be become a place that is constricted and then the smoke and the, the heat and the stench of the hellfire will come to their grave and they will pray, may the day of judgment never come and their life in the grave will be like a long time. And when the day of judgment comes, truly it will be a day of terror, a day of fear. It's a day that is described in the Quran when a man will run away, people will run away from each other, even your mother. Why? Because on this day, everyone is only going to care about themselves because the deeds will be weighed. The people who disbelieved, how long will this be? It will seem like 50,000 years. Just the day of judgment will, will be like 50,000 years. Just that one day. And then at the end of this wait of 50,000 years, the people who made partners with God, God will not even question them. They will just be dragged into the hellfire. What is this hellfire? This hellfire is a place of unbelievable suffering and pain. There will be no happiness, there will be no joy, only anxiety and worry and stress and fear and terror. Death will approach people there from every single side, but they will not approach death. The fire will burn the skins, but God will recreate the skin so the skins can be burnt. People will be so thirsty, they will scream and call for drink and they will get a drink that is like boiling water that will melt their faces and boil their insides. The food of hellfire is a tree that is so bitter, it's fruit that you can't swallow it. But the people will make themselves, force themselves to swallow it. 
but that will only increase their thirst and they will call for water and you can imagine how long does this go on this goes on forever and ever and ever this is the true reality surely this life is just a moment almost an illusion the final and important article of faith is the belief in the divine decree now some people use the term destiny but I don't like using that term at all because the concept of destiny or fate comes with a whole load of misunderstandings that people have and that leads them to become confused let me explain to you very simply what it is that a Muslim has to believe in respect to this the first thing to understand is that God knows everything. This is one of the attributes of God. God is the all-knower of all things. There is nothing, whether it is a leaf that falls, an ant that crawls, an atom that moves, not something greater than that or less than that, except that Allah knows it. The second thing that we believe in respect to the divine decree is that not only does God know everything, but 50,000 years before God created this universe, this creation, the first thing he created was the pen. And he ordered the pen to write. And the pen wrote down everything that was going to happen from the beginning of the creation to the end. And this, this book in which everything has been written has been preserved in a place which is called the Lohul Mahfuz, which is above the seven heavens. So this is the book of the divine decree that everything that is going to happen has been written. That includes whether we are going to go to paradise or hellfire, what we will do, what we will not do, what we would do if we did do this or if we didn't do that. Everything is included in this book. Nothing can happen unless God allows it to happen because God has power over everything. All the means for us to obey God or disobey God has been created by Him. You cannot obey God unless God lets you. And unless God gives you the means to do that. You cannot disobey God unless God lets you and God gives you the means to do that. However, what is important to understand is that God has given us the choice. One of the things that God has allowed us to do is to choose whether we obey him or whether we disobey him so that is what god has allowed us to do and god will judge us based upon that that's what god will judge us upon now some people are confused because they make an unnecessary and an unfounded correlation and connection between god knowing everything and writing it down and those things happening and I want to explain this through a simple example to make you understand that the fact that God knows it and the fact that God has written it does not mean that the Creator has forced you to do it I will give you an example imagine a teacher a teacher has a class of students the teacher having taught these students for many years begins to understand a lot about their character and a lot about their ability to pass or fail an exam. So she has some knowledge about her students. And not only does she have some knowledge about her students, she predicts the grades that, the, that she thinks they are going to get. Now, if all the students in the class actually get the grades that she predicts they're going to get, does that mean that she forced them to get those grades? No, it doesn't mean that. They still made the choice whether they were going to study or not study, whether they were going to attend the exam or not attend the exam. And although we cannot make a similitude, we are not comparing God to his creation, the point that we are illustrating here is that if a limited human being with their limited knowledge can make some type of predictions about their students then this is even more possible in respect to God that his knowledge is perfect is absolutely perfect but that does not mean that the Creator has forced you to obey him or disobey him you still have the choice 
He wants you to obey him and he wants you to leave disobedience to him. But he has not forced you to do that. Amongst the other important things that we have to believe in respect to the divine decree, that there are certain things that have been measured for us. For example, our livelihood, our lifespan. These things have been determined. How much money we are going to earn, how much food we are going to be able to eat, how long we are going to live. These things have been determined, predetermined for us. But we don't know what that lifespan or what that provision is. If you have achieved some benefit in this world, that is because there has been a certain amount of wealth or a certain uh, lifespan that has been measured for you. And also, if some negative things happen to you, you should not fall into despair. It was already decreed and it was determined and measured for you. Actually, this allows us not to be fatalistic and not to just surrender to fate and not make an effort. This is not what is intended at all. Rather, it means that we should not over-exalt ourselves when we achieve something and we should not get too depressed and too sad when we don't achieve something. What does God want from us? We do our best to achieve what is pleasing to God. But if something overtakes us and something overwhelms us, then we have to accept and understand that there are certain things that happen to us and that is part of what has been decreed for us. As long as we are doing our best and long, as long as we are seeking and to avoid his displeasure, then that is going to be the path to the real success in this life and the next. Every human and every jinn were to become so pious and so obedient to God, then this would not increase God's kingdom at all. And that whatever is going to reach us, it would never have passed us by. And whatever passed us by, it was never going to reach us. And if the worst of us, if all of us, the human of us and the jinn of us came together, and we became like the worst and the most wicked soul amongst us, it would not decrease in God's kingdom whatsoever. We have to understand very importantly that really in reality we are the creatures and we are the servants of God. We do our best to obey Him, but ultimately what God wills is what is going to pass.